All right, so um, hey everybody, thank you guys so much for coming out um, for this event tonight. Uh, it's very, very weird to be up here talking about something that's not introducing a speaker or talking about what Brandon is. So uh, it actually makes me a little, a little nervous. I'm not used to being nervous up here, but sure, why not? let's try it. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about kind of a lot of different things tonight in a, in a short period of time. Um, Franklin Rosemont, uh, who is the author of this book, um, which is called Joe Hill, The IWW, The Making of Revolutionary Working Class Counterculture. I'm going to say that subtitle again because it's like so incredibly important. So the subtitle of the book is The IWW and the Making of a Revolutionary Working Class Counterculture. Um, and this book, in its vast size, um, ranges in topic from obviously being a, a biography, a creative biography, an archival biography of Joe Hill, the uh, famous IWW revolutionary martyr, songs, um, songwriter, poet, cartoonist, um, hobo, uh, and labor organizer. Uh, it's also a book about Franklin's own trajectory, his own um, development as a historian and as a surrealist. Um, and so it's also a book about surrealism. But fundamentally, it's a book about culture. Um, it's a book about the way that um, the way that culture acts as a historical agent, um, the way that individuals move through history um, and shape the culture around us. Um, and Joe Hill is Joe Hill's one of those people. So, how many folks have heard of Joe Hill before? What do you know about him? What do you know about Joe Hill? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, 1905. Yeah. And what was he? What was he? So what was he officially executed for? Do you remember? For murder. He was convicted. He was tried, convicted for murder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he was um, he was he was accused of murder. It was it was a lover's crime um, that he was accused of committing. Um, so he was a, he was ostensibly wrapped up in some sort of a some sort of a triangle. Um, he was executed uh, as a result of being accused of murder. Um, there's very little credible evidence as to whether or not Joe Hill actually committed the murder that he was executed for, but there is quite a bit of evidence to point towards the fact that this was a, this was a case of political framing, that Joe Hill was a dangerous revolutionary who was involved with the IWW, the most radical of all labor unions, and that Joe Hill was, was framed. Um, and it's an interesting, um, Joe Hill is an interesting figure because he's someone who, um, He's one of those people who has become more famous in his death than he was in his life. And what Franklin has tried to do in this book is kind of unpack both the myth and the man of Joe Hill. So talking about the, the mythos and the, the ethos around this figure of Joe Hill, this great revolutionary martyr figure um, whose you know, sort of parting words to us have, have sort of come down as don't mourn, organize, right? So don't mourn for me, but go out and organize to keep the movement going. Um, what Franklin has tried to do is unpack who Joe Hill was, where he came from, all the different um, cities and states and countries that he passed through, all the different lives that he touched with his songs and his cartoons, and his, uh, his organizing, but also to look at what that story of Joe Hill has done for us as revolutionaries, for us as, as a part of a revolutionary labor movement, and certainly for us as a part of a revolutionary working class counterculture. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, what I want to do is talk a little bit more about Franklin Rosemont at the beginning. So Franklin Rosemont is the, is the author of this book. Um, and how many folks have heard of Franklin Rosemont before? Franklin Rosemont is probably one of the most important historians of the 20th century, um, and is certainly one of the most important historians uh, that, that most people have never, have never heard of. Um, this book is, I would say, one of the greatest works of history of the, of the 20th century. It's also one of the greatest works of surrealism. Um, 
of the 20th century. And those are not things that we tend to think about in the same context, right? It's very rare for somebody to be like, this is a great work of history, and also it's a surrealist text. But that's, that's ultimately the claim that I would make um, about this book. So, um, I want to maybe start by uh, actually reading you a little story. So Franklin Rosemont is somebody who was very, very important for me in terms of my own political development and in terms of my own um, entrance into this world of labor organizing, collective organizing, um, and the kind of political space that, that Red Emma's is. Franklin actually was very important for the founding of Red Emma's. Um, he was one of the folks that at that point um, had stewardship of a publishing house called Charles H. Kerr, which was the oldest um, socialist press in the United States. Um, he was someone who had a history of building bookstores with a political and community focus, just like Red Emma's, and Red Emma's was actually in part based on Solidarity Bookshop, which was a bookstore that, that Franklin founded with other organizers in Chicago in the 1960s. Um, he was also someone that was inspiring to us politically because he was precisely working at this intersection of imagination and organizing. This intersection of imagination and politics, which was something that was very much a part of the, the place that Red Emma's came from. Um, so, I'm going to read uh, the story of the first time that I met Franklin Rosemont. Um, and this is actually from a, a book that some of you know I've been working on for far too many years at this point, which I will publish someday, maybe. Um, but it's actually a, a partial biography of Franklin Rosemont and a history of the Chicago Surrealist Group, um, which is the, the group that, that Franklin found. So, okay. Um, so this is how, this is my story of meeting Franklin Rosemont. Franklin Rosemont doesn't look like a Surrealist reads a line in my hastily scribbled notes on the back of a series of receipts written as the Chicago L carried me away from my first meeting with the founder of America's only homegrown surrealist movement. What had I been expecting? Perhaps to meet a man dressed impeccably in a black suit and a crisp white shirt? Or perhaps wearing a set of multicolored robes? Or that he would insist on us all ordering drinks in varying hues of greens, as surrealism's founder, Andre Breton, reportedly did. Clearly, I had missed the mark. Tall, lanky, and rapidly gray, dressed in a short-sleeved plaid shirt and baggy, faded pants, Rosemont looked more like someone's slightly unkempt Marxist uncle than the inheritor of one of the world's most enduring traditions of political and poetic revolt. I'd known about Franklin Rosemont and the work of the Chicago Surrealist Group for a number of years, since a friend had discovered the fourth and final issue of the Chicago-based journal, Arsenal, Surrealist Subversions in a second-hand bookshop in San Francisco, and had brought it home to the small community of artists and activists in Philadelphia where I lived at the time. I'd read Andre Breton's Surrealist Manifesto in high school and been captivated, and I was fortunate enough to fall into the crowd around a beloved professor at my college who taught avant-garde film and literature as though he were living. We came out of those classes with a sense that Surrealism held some real promise for the kinds of political work we wanted to do but we couldn't quite see how to take the various experiments with automatism we'd been trying and the copious amounts of René Crevel and Benjamin Perret we'd been reading and apply them to these very critical real-life struggles that we were fighting as activists in late 1990s America. Enter Arsenal. We are living, precariously enough, the Chicago Surrealists wrote, in a strange place called the United States, a nation founded on genocide, and whose government, the most murderous in history, is the deadliest enemy of human freedom in the world today. We surrealists are more than ever communists, anarchists, atheists, irreconcilable revolutionists, implacable enemies of things as they are, unrepentant seekers of a truly free society. And how do we reach this truly free society? We start by dreaming. Those who don't know how to cross their bridges before they come to them will never get anywhere. Now there was something striking in that passage for us. The gist seemed to be that one had to imagine what a better world might look like before one could change it. It was the beginning of the movement against an increasingly globalized world, against the spread of structural adjustment policies and the hegemony of global capital, which had begun to reach a crisis point. These were the years just before things exploded in Seattle in 1999 at the annual meeting of the World Trade Organization, fanning the flames of what would become a decade of creative revolt around the globe. 
A few years later, really just a few years after we first discovered this, another world is possible would become the slogan of the fully formed anti-globalization movement. But it seemed that the Surrealists had hit upon the idea first. So we started doing research on the Chicago Surrealists, our, our little Philadelphia group, and we discovered more and more and more of the things that they'd been writing and the, and the, the theory and the political, um, the political uh, structures that they'd been developing. And we found copies of the first three issues of Arsenal after scouring used bookstores all across the country. We organized a Surrealist group in Philadelphia and we operated as a collective determined to demonstrate through the practical application of the imagination what a different world might look like. In 2000, we took on a central role in the organizing around the Republican National Convention, which was due to invade our city that August. Coming on the heels of the uprising in Seattle and subsequent insurrections in Washington, D.C. and New York City, the Philly police were not taking any chances. They infiltrated and then seized the West Philadelphia warehouse, which served as the puppet-making headquarters, arresting 75 activists guilty of nothing more than building giant paper mache dolls confiscating, or as far as we were concerned, jailing hundreds of brightly colored puppets. Surely, surely this went against every instinct of a surrealist. So we decided the time was right to contact the Chicago Surrealist Group. We wrote a letter asking them to issue a statement in support of the puppets. We never received a response. Years later, Sitting in the Heartland Cafe at Rogers Park, Chicago, surrounded by panels from Paul Boy's Marvelous Wobbly's comic book, an exhibition installed in the honor of the 100th anniversary of the IWW, the centennial celebrations of which I traveled to Chicago to attend, Franklin Rosemont somewhat suspiciously asked me what I had to do with surrealism. So I rambled for like 15 or 20 minutes about my interest in Andre Breton and the surrealist projects that we'd been working on in Philadelphia, how I'd come to see the work that we were doing in the squatting community and in collectively run spaces as being aligned with surrealism's communalist impulses, about how we'd started the Philadelphia Radical Surrealist Front after reading Arsenal, about how we had started Red Emma's after hearing about Solidarity Bookshop. And I could see that he wasn't really buying this. And so then finally, I stammered, we, we wrote you a letter, actually, when they stole all of our puppets? And I could see the recognition dawning on his face, and he said, oh, that was you? Oh, now I know who you are. And from that moment on, Franklin and I had a very um, fruitful and very close relationship. Um, and for me, I wanted to tell this story for a couple of reasons. One, because I, I like the story of meeting Franklin. Um, I like the idea that it took that moment of recognition, it took that kind of uncanny connection for him to really fully understand um, where I fit into this surrealist universe that he was so invested in, in building and writing and documenting. Um, I also like to tell this story because the moment that I met Franklin was 2005. This was the 100th anniversary of the founding of the IWW, which was founded in 1905 in Chicago. Um, and the Chicago Surrealist Group and the project that Franklin would undertake along with the other revolutionaries and radicals that he was working with in the 1960s who founded the Chicago Surrealist Group um, was very, very steeped in the history and the tradition of the IWW. And in fact, it's not going too far to say that this particular group of young radicals had quite a bit to do with the resurgence of interest in the IWW that you start to see in the context of the political organizing circles of the 1960s. Franklin Rosemont, Penelope Rosemont, Paul Guerin, many of the other folks that were organizing with them that formed the nucleus of the Chicago Surrealist Group also formed the nucleus of a, a kind of new radical incarnation of the IWW in the 1960s. And Franklin wrote, we recognize the IWW as Joe Hill's union, and as the direct heir to 1880s Chicago idea anarchism, a fundamentally anti-authoritarian group that left open lots of room for individual and small group improvisation, the only group in which we could develop our wide-ranging inclinations to rethink revolutionary theory, to explore the subversive possibilities of popular culture, and above all, to pursue our passion for poetic action. That is, for life as adventure. We knew that the IWW had a place for all of these and that no other group would tolerate them. So that's Franklin writing about um, the reasons that, for him, 
surrealism and the IWW can be seen as inheritors of the same kind of poetic tradition, the same tradition of sustained revolt, of revolutionary action, um, of, of a certain kind of political action, but a political action that is above all guided by a sense of possibility and a belief um, and a primacy placed on the imagination. Um, and that certainly is one of the things that, that Franklin finds so striking in the character of, of Joe Hill. And it's one of the things that he spends a great deal of time um, unpacking in this book. Um, I could kind of go on about Franklin and, and Joe Hill um, forever and ever, but I kind of think I want to turn it over to Dave at this point to talk a little bit more about the book itself. Um, and then we can kind of come back and talk more about surrealism and about the history of the, of the I-dubs, if that's something that folks want to do at the end. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's really gratifying to see people out. To, I mean, the author's not here, and we're trying to talk about him and talk about the book um, a little bit. It's a cold night, so thanks uh, very much for showing up. Um, it's good for us, I think, to, to do this because Franklin uh, died suddenly uh, about six or seven years after the Joe Hill book came out, and about six or seven years ago. So it left a big hole in the left in Chicago and in the surrealist movement and in our lives, I think, in, in a lot of ways. Um, so I am going to eventually read a little bit from the book to you and talk about the book. But I also want to uh, reminisce about Franklin uh, just a little bit along some of the same lines that Kate did. And that is to, to say, um, to think about when I first met Franklin and some of the things that I uh, remember about him fondly and sometimes a little frustratingly. Uh, I think we met, we, some of us uh, had a collective bookstore in Rogers Park in Chicago called Red Rose. It was, I think, it was a terrible idea. It was, I think, the only uh, non-sectarian Trotskyist bookstore in the history of the United States. And of course, it <laughs> turned out not to be so non-sectarian as we thought. Uh, but uh, it was in Franklin's neighborhood, and so he would stop by, and we had uh, lots of books and very few customers, and so he would sit and read and sit and talk to us. And uh, we together then started to uh, try to respond to two things that were happening in the city and the country. Uh, one was an attempt of the Nazi, the American Nazi Party to march in Skokie, some of you, uh, which was a Jewish suburb, is a Jewish suburb of Chicago. Uh, some of you may know of absolutely fanciful made-for-TV movie about the response, Danny Kaye was in it, about the response to this threatened Nazi protest in a, a suburb, that, uh, an inner suburb that was kind of filled with Holocaust uh, survivors and families that had, had uh, lost people in that. And, and so we began to try to organize uh, mass presence to turn the Nazis back in that uh, situation. We, that group was called the Chicago Anti-Nazi League. And actually, Rebecca Hill is trying to do some of this history uh, right now. But the other thing we did was uh, organize a support committee for the uh, 1979 miners' strike. And uh, we tried to occupy the fake coal mine in the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. We picketed and then went into this uh, this museum where Peabody Coal at that time had a mine that you looked like you could eat off the floor of. It was just the nicest place ever that you could go through on a train. And so it was kind of this pro-company uh, propaganda and during the strike we picked that as a focus of activity. And out of those kinds of, uh, I think I'm one of the very few people who came to Surrealism almost purely with, well, with no artistic talent uh, for one thing, but also with uh, not thinking of it, first of all, as a, as a movement of artists and poets, but thinking of it as a movement of anarchists and radicals and the kinds of things that you were uh, talking about. So one of the projects that Franklin and uh, Penelope Rosemont, his partner, uh, who survives, and, uh, and an important artist and, and uh, writer herself, one of the projects that they had was uh, they and some of us took over the Charles H. Kerr Publishing Company, which is the world's oldest socialist 
where it was all this radical publisher it started in 1886, uh, the year of Haymarket. And uh, we were kind of given the press by old timers who realized that they couldn't make a go of it anymore. And so they sort of picked us out. And some of them then didn't want to give it to us. <laughs> so there was this kind of productive period of controversy where we came together to try to figure out how to make sure we maintain ties with the older generation, but also had our own project uh, with this press. One of the old timers uh, was a great old uh, IWW member named Fred Thompson, who wrote the history of uh, the IWW's history of itself. Uh, and Fred was by that time in his 70s and then 80s, and, and uh, continued to write. Uh, continued to come to Kerr Company meetings, and he saw his role as trying to, I'm getting toward the book eventually here, uh, he saw his role as to keep us from completely bankrupting the, the press with harebrained schemes about books that could never possibly sell. So the, the one intervention that Fred made in every meeting that I was in with him was he would, somebody would have a proposal for a book and he would say, that would be of interest to you and to me and to a half a dozen other people in the whole world. <laughs> and that was his way of saying, no, you're not going to go forward with this. So we always, when we had an idea, we had to be pretty careful that it seemed like a practical thing to do. When Franklin brought the Joe, so he, Franklin discovered these 15 Joe Hill cartoons. And he was a he was writing when he died a history of uh, radical cartooning in the United States, and Hill was a, originally a part of that. But then he found that there were enough Hill cartoons that he wanted to um, collect them in a very small but very lavish uh, book. They're not they're in the book here, but they're not great cartoons. And Franklin eventually allowed that they were kind of interesting and and tell us something about Joe Hill but not really works. Um, so he had these 15 cartoons and he projected a 100 page book. And I think part of the reason was that that's what he really wanted to write. But the other part was that he knew that Fred would say, if he said, I'm gonna write a 700 page book about 15 cartoons, that wouldn't have flown <laughs> in, the, in the meeting. So. Over the next, I don't know, five or six years after the book was proposed, Franklin would kind of sheepishly send us things saying, oh, well, here's another chapter I added to this, and here's another chapter. And it added um, to the cartooning was he began to take up Joe Hill's much more famous uh, cultural production, which is Hill's music. And he began to write about that and the great uh, IWW folklorist, labor folklorist Archie Green and Franklin and I in South Salerno were at that time doing a, a collection of all of the Little Red songbooks into a big book called the Big Red uh, Songbook. So out of those very, very great connections with Archie, who was a, a old guy at that time and willing to, a very, very giving scholar, Franklin got a lot of materials on Hill's uh, music. But then he also just kind of got the idea that anything that touched Joe Hill and was interesting um, and came to him ought to be a chapter in the book. So um, the surrealists have this, uh, this uh, phrase called objective chance, which so if two people uh, say the same thing at the same time, or, uh, or if uh, two people happen upon the same obscure thing uh, in, the, in the same period, uh, they regard it as objective, but also as chance. And uh, so a lot of things that Archie became passionate about, and Franklin happened to also become passionate about, Franklin not only thought they were interesting, but he thought that this was kind of faded, that, they, that you had to write about it because it had emerged in this kind of magical, special uh, sort, of, sort of way. So the book kind of grew from something like a 100-page book to a 200-page book to a 300-page book, and eventually to what ends up a 700-page book. And it also, I think, uh, worked in that way. I mean, it, um, in the introduction that I wrote for this edition of it, 
I suggest that there that it's since C.P. Thompson published the uh, making of the uh, English working class, which is exactly the shape <laughs> and size. Uh, there have been three great works of, of history of labor history. Uh, one I think is uh, Walter Rodney's history of the Guineas working class uh, in the world. Uh, and then Peter Leinbau and Marcus Redeker's Many Headed Hydra. And then I think this is the third book. So one of the things that we might think about is, you know, how somebody who didn't finish high school kind of talked his way into Roosevelt University, this was Franklin, uh, didn't finish Roosevelt University, how he was able to write such a surpassing work of history. And I think part of it is that it was an advantage for him not to be in in academic work, he didn't. He had a lot of time. He didn't spend waste his time going to meetings. He he was a teacher, but in informal uh, sorts of ways. So I think that's something that we might think and talk about a little bit. Is what's the uh, uh, what do we lose when people begin to think that to do intellectual things you have to be in a college, uh, which I think is often kind of people's supposition. Uh, now that book writers are somehow people who hustle jobs in a, in a college. And Franklin was uh, not at all anti-intellectual, loved to be around uh, people who were, uh, who were professors, but uh, he really was not a part of that at all. And, and you couldn't write a book like this if you were trying to get tenure, if you were trying to, uh, uh, to jump through academic hoops. It takes too long, for one thing. And uh, it's too strange. It's too outside of kind of mainstream uh, publishing. So um, I, want, I want just one more Franklin thing, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the section of the book that's on Chinese cooking uh, and, Joe, and Joe Hill, which I think is the most symptomatic uh, section of how, what a wonderful uh, book this is. But one of the things that, that uh, I think Franklin loved about Joe Hill is Hill born in 1879, and he comes to the United States uh, 30 years later, uh, 25 years later, and, he, and he, he's a kind of prototypical uh, itinerant worker in the IWW. And, and there's a, at that time and even today, there was a kind of a tendency to take wobbly radicalism as being connected with being a hobo or being an itinerant uh, workers, so there was even maybe a little bit of an over exaggeration of how different the uh, footloose rebel, as uh, what we call it, was from a settled worker with a wife and kids and a, and house payments. And uh, so Franklin, who owned a house, and, uh, was very settled when I knew him. Really loved this idea of the, of itinerancy, and he had. Uh, one of the stories he, he often told was that in his own youth, uh, after he joined the IWW in his 20s, he hitchhiked around the country. And he said, he, he often said, I hitchhiked 25,000 miles. And uh, it was kind of a, a way of saying he was this footloose rebel. And I thought, wow, I could probably hitchhiked 75,000 miles. And, but I didn't like it. I mean, I thought it was miserable. <laughs> it was just a way to get around. But Franklin was able to do it and maintain this uh, um, romance uh, with the kind of idea of being, and he, he led a strike in Michigan uh, as an IWW among blueberry pickers, having hitchhiked to the place. And so he had a lot of, I think, uh, fellow feeling with uh, Hill as that person even though he hardly traveled at all at that stage of his life, the last 20 years of his life, he hardly left uh, uh, Chicago a bit. So I want to focus on this uh, chapter that's on Joe Hill and the art of Chinese cooking. I'm just going to read Franklin's words a little bit, but it's a perfect example of how uh, he would find these things that were a point of entry into Joe Hill uh, and then just kind of go on about them. I don't know if anybody's read uh, the journalist, uh, the late uh, journalist Tony Lucas's uh, book on the Haywood Moyer Pettibone uh, case, the IWW, it's called Big Trouble. 
and uh, his book is exactly the same thing. And when he wrote it, he had turned to Franklin for advice. He had, who had about three or four Pulitzer Prizes, uh, was turning to Franklin for advice about how you would study the history of the of the IWW. And, but between the two of them, they really developed this idea that history is kind of a collage that you just accumulate things and say more things. So in big trouble, you can find a whole 30-page chapter on minor league baseball in Idaho. Uh, you know, and it does tell you something. It does get you at the atmosphere of what was going on. So here's, here's Franklin, but for a particular purpose. Um, the title of the chapter is The Importance of Chinese Cooking in the History of the IWW. And I'm just going to read a page and a half. To ascertain Joe Hill's attitude toward particular social questions can be a daunting task, for we have so little to go on. His songs and cartoons, a handful of letters, a very few other scattered writings, uh, court records, occasional comments by relatives and friends, and that's it. Sometimes, however, the tiniest scrap of information can bring an unexpected illumination. Strange as it may seem, for example, Hill's fondness for Chinese food, his skill in the use of chopsticks, and the fact that he was, quote, well-liked for his mar marvelous Chinese cookery, as Walt, uh, Wallace Stegner was kind of a hostile writer on Hill, uh, rather mockingly conceded, add a touch of concreteness to our otherwise hazy knowledge of his race politics. What makes such seemingly trivial details important, even subversive, is the fact that in the US in the 1910s, the nation was rife with anti-Chinese yellow peril hysteria. Hatred of the Chinese was fomented not only by the usual culprits, employers, cops, churches, the press, but also by a large part of what passed for the labor movement that is, the American Federation of Labor. In the Western states, and above all in California, where Hill spent at least four and probably more of his US years, AFL unions carried on a massive and vicious anti-Chinese propaganda campaign. This was related to the national AFL's overall commitment to white supremacy and was spelled out in a characteristic but too little known statement by AFL President Samuel Gompers, rhetorically posing the question of how, and here he quotes Gompers, to prevent the Chinese, the Negritos, and the Malays from coming to our country. How can we um, prevent the Chinese coolies from swarming into the United States and engulfing our people and our civilization? Can we hope to close the floodgates of immigration from the hordes of Chinese and the semi-savage races? And Gompers particularly wrote about this after uh, building the Panama Canal, the conquest of, of Puerto Rico, and the occupation of the Philippines because he thought that these territories were going to bring more people of color uh, to the United States. There can be no doubt, Franklin writes, that AFL yellow peril propaganda helped provoke some of the many lynchings of Chinese workers that occurred in those years. A large part of this anti-Chinese propaganda consisted of racist caricatures in which everything Chinese was made to appear villainous, conspiratorial, evil, despicable, and dirty. Chop suey and eating with chopsticks were held up for especially scornful ridicule. Meanwhile, adding injury to insult, AFL unions vigorously promoted the boycott of Chinese restaurants. So Franklin, he only really knows this one thing, this one scrap, and the chapter goes on another 10 pages after this. But that he knows this one scrap about uh, Hills bragging about and inviting people over for uh, Chinese cooking, learning to cook, and then he poses the question, who taught Joe Hill to, to cook Chinese food? And uh, Hill took people when they went out to Chinese restaurants, and he wants to say, look how different this is from AFL, yellow peril kind of propaganda. There's a story that the wobbly uh, nickname for the IWW comes from an imitation of the uh, speech of a Chinese cook or Chinese worker uh, trying to say IWW and ending up saying wobbly, uh, I wobbly wobbly. And uh, that's a kind of a little bit of racism that makes its way into IWW history. And Franklin was very interesting in this chapter. He doesn't deny the racism, 
that would animate a story like that, and we don't know if the story is true. Uh, but he does say, if we look at this whole picture of Joe Hill's life and think about him as somebody who also embraced uh, Chinese workers and Chinese culture, and we think about how it was that the IWW was alone on the U.S. left, or practically alone, in championing the rights of Chinese workers, we get to a very different kind of uh, point of view. So I'll stop there. Thanks.